Hello, friends of history. Uh, it is, I'm Margaret O'Meara. I am professor of history at the University of Washington in the history department. And I'm pleased to introduce the video recording of History Behind the Headlines, which is an event that I hosted and moderated on May 29th, 2020. Um, I am right, I'm taping this introduction for you a few days later. It's actually June 4th as I tape this. Um, because we had a glitch in the recording and we started a little bit into our first presentation by the panelists. So I'm going to reintroduce our discussion. Um, and in doing so on June 4th, as opposed to May 29th, there's been a lot that has happened in America since then. We conceived this panel as an opportunity to reach out to our history students and to their families with whom many of them are sheltering in place during this remote spring quarter because of the COVID-19 pandemic caused by the novel coronavirus. Um, and, uh, and thought that there was an opportunity to delve into the, the, what we can learn from crises that societies, both America and abroad, have faced before, and what we can learn about what individuals, institutions can do, uh, and where Christ, how crises have been met or not met, and to learn from history, learn that history behind the headlines. As we were convening on Friday, uh, protests were beginning in American cities in response to the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police. In the days since, there have been successive days of protest and violence response, state and extra legal response to that protest um, in not only Seattle, but cities and towns across the United States. We don't know yet what the broader meaning or where we will go from here and what lies ahead of us in 2020, but it underscores ever more how important history, how the importance of history, why history matters, why understanding the past is essential to help us not only understand the present, but to navigate the future and to reckon with the truths of the past, as well as find hope in history and to craft new possibilities. Um, the, the protests that around the United States are not only um, in response to the murder of George Floyd, but also to the, the deaths, the murders of many other people of color, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia, um, and so many others here in Seattle, including here in Seattle, um, Victims including John T. Williams, a Native American woodcock carver shot by Seattle police several years ago. All of those incidents and the racial inequities of the COVID-19 pandemic inform what the nation and the world is going experiencing right now. So I'm going to do what I did on Friday and give a very brief introduction to our panelists to key up their talk in turn. And then after that, we're gonna have Q&A with the audience. There were some um, audience members who submitted uh, questions in advance and others uh, asked questions as we went through the Zoom. So I'm gonna give very quick introductions to my colleagues who will be speaking in alphabetical order by last name. First, we'll hear from James Gregory. Jim Gregory, his research and teaching centers on four aspects of 20th century United States history labor history, particularly the history of American radicalism, regionalism, both in the West and the South, race and civil rights history, and migration, especially inside the United States. Our second speaker is Laurie Marhofer. She's a historian of 20th century queer and trans politics. Her book on fascism and the politics of sex and gender um, Sex in the Weimar Republic, Ger German Homosexual Emancipation and Rise of the Nazis came out in 2015. She's been published in the American Historical Review, German Studies Review, and she writes frequently for, um, for popular po publications, um, op-eds in The Conversation in, and in other um, mass outlets. Adam Warren is our third speaker. Adam is a historian of Latin America and a specialist in Peru and the Andes. His research focuses on the history of medicine and the history of scientific experimentation in both the late colonial period and the national period. He also teaches a course on the history of global health at the University of Washington. He's gonna be talking about that. 
Glennis Young is our fourth and final speaker. Um, last but hardly least, Professor Glennis Young is also chair of the history department. She's a historian of Russia and the Soviet Union. Her work has focused on the USSR's involvement in transnational movements and processes, whether political, social, cultural, or economic. She's also researched the history of communism and world history and published articles on a number of topics in Soviet social and political history. And she's gonna be talking not only about Russia, but particularly about the experience of Western Europe and what we can learn from how the European responses to the coronavirus have differed from American ones. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our, go back in time to the 29th, to our session in progress and to Professor Jim Gregory. Crises are, have been solved essentially or addressed by societies for the last century or since the 1930s in one basic way. A lot of public spending is, is poured into the economy to get it going again. And that creates opportunities, potential opportunities. And the two crises we've seen have, uh, in, have addressed these opportunities in different ways. You spend a lot of money and you can spend it on infrastructure. And that's what happened in the 1930s. The New Deal poured all of its money into jobs, but jobs building things, especially construction and educational spending. And out of that came thousands of bridges and highways and airports and buildings and dams in our region. The whole region was reimagined essentially through the electrification provided by Bonneville Dam and the sequence of dams of Columbia. This picture also shows the I-90 bridge, which was another part. Now something different happened in 2008, 2009, and a big opportunity to build a lot, to repair infrastructure was lost. It was lost because of political fighting. The Republicans insisted on an austerity budget and literally shut down the government at various points in order to prevent the kind of spending that might have brought us new infrastructure. So political agendas change, opportunities, social movements, newly politicized populations in great crisis, often energized and angry, can change the direction of, of societies. And that can either be towards more democracy or less. In the New Deal era, it was massive voting by new immigrant populations and also by African Americans that enabled the New Deal and out of that and transformed the Democratic Party in the process and expanded voter participation and expanded the, the rights of ordinary Americans. After the Great Recession, really a very different set of social movements took charge. Um, angry conservatives taking the Republican Party in directions that were new, uh, including revitalizing xenophobic agendas that had, in a previous generation, been uh, delegitimized. So these crises of change kind of the way politics are going to work and we need you know we don't know how this new one is going to work one of the key things that policymakers in the 1930s and policymakers at all points should keep in mind it's is how do you protect the younger generation how do you protect the young adults how do you because they're the future of the society you have to do something to make sure that they are not lost, that they don't become a lost generation in a crisis like this. And in the 1930s, the New Deal administrators were on the job. They knew this was a priority. One of the first things they created was the Civilian Conservation Corps, which put hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions of young men, very gendered, to work in the woods, building parks and, and the like. And that was designed to rescue the younger generation. And they followed up by creating the National Youth Administration, which made grants, various stipends, in order to keep young people in school, high school and college, and job training programs. And this really represented the first federal investment in higher education. Unfortunately, in the Great Recession, that lesson was not learned. 
young people suffered the highest rates of unemployment of any of the age groups. And meanwhile, higher education funding was slashed, tuitions were doubled, and young people were encouraged to endure, to take on student debt lo loads that, that remain 10 years later, a huge cloud over their uh, ability to function. Uh, this is a compelling photograph of a, a recent college uh, protest about this. So there are other things we could talk about, um, where people live, how they live, all of that trans is transformed in great, um, great crises. I think we're pretty clearly seeing the end of the long era of globalization as trade, uh, travel, and immigration are shut down. And it's going to be hard for that to be reset to the old patterns. Uh, I think in the rise of nationalist rhetoric everywhere uh, says that we're, we're moving away from that kind of movement across borders that has been a mark of the last 50 years. Uh, within the borders too, we're probably setting up for some different changes. In the other two crises, people started for a variety of reasons having to do with um, technology and government spending, people started moving to big cities more and more and more. I think we're gonna see the opposite here, the fear of the disease, the new tech, new um, kind of use of work from home technologies probably means that more people are gonna be leaving big cities and moving to the suburbs again. In any case, there's much more we could talk about, but my time is up and I wanna turn this over to my colleague, uh, Professor Marhofer. Okay, thanks so much, Jim. Let me just, hi everybody. This is so crazy. There's like a hundred people and I, but I'm um, alone in a room. What a, <laughs> and that's what, and that's what it's all about these days. Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, so there was this other uh, pandemic of a virus that jumped from animals into humans. And many of you lived through it and we are still living through it. It's still going on. It's the pandemic of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. HIV is much less contagious. It's much slower moving than is this new virus that we're dealing with, than, than is SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus. Um, it's much slower, okay? Uh, and it took a lot longer for HIV to circle the globe. So we now think that HIV jumped from animals into humans in the 1920s, upriver from Kinshasa, in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Humans only noticed AIDS in 1981, oddly in Los Angeles, thousands of miles from where HIV had first found a human host. So HIV is slower compared to SARS-CoV-2 and it's less contagious. And it has now killed about as many people as died in the first world war. Uh, AIDS still kills 1 million people every year and there are about 40 million people around the world who are living with HIV. So one lesson that I think we can take from this is that we have to take this thing really, really seriously. We may get a vaccine. I, I think we're all hoping for that and that may happen and, and that would be wonderful. Uh, we're all, many of us are probably thinking about the, the amazing smallpox eradication campaign. Smallpox was declared eradicated worldwide in 1980. Uh, many of us are probably thinking of the polio vaccine which, um, which changed so many lives. Um, so we may get a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, uh, and we may not, we may not. HIV has proved really difficult to, to vaccinate for, and an HIV vaccine has, has been very elusive, or, although there is still some hope, but lots of money has been spent, and so far there is no vaccine. What we may get for COVID is a really great treatment, which, would, which is what we got for AIDS eventually. But no matter how the, the, the science and the public health plays out, I think we're gonna see with SARS-CoV-2 what we see with HIV now and, and what we've seen historically, which is that these diseases, these viruses really correlate with poverty and with inequality. And they hit people worse when those people don't have access to a good healthcare system and they can't afford medicine. And with something as contagious as SARS-CoV-2, that's, that's a problem for those of us who are fortunate to live in wealthy countries where we do have access to, uh, many of us do have access to medical care. Um, okay, 
So uh, the history of HIV also offers us some hope. This is not a hopeful slide. This is a slide about 1985. I, I'm sorry, 1995. This is a slide about 1995. 1985, AIDS, uh, the picture was very bleak. It was an automatic death sentence to get an HIV diagnosis. AIDS was a leading cause of death around the world. Things were only getting worse. It was spreading, death rates were going up. But then something wonderful happened. In 1996, scientists rolled out antiretroviral treatment, um, ARVs, antiretroviral drugs, combo therapy. It was called the cocktail initially. Um, uh, this was a miracle treatment. Uh, multiple drugs used together could practically halt the progress of HIV in a person's body, and it saved millions of lives. These medications were so dramatic uh, that, that the, the effect that they had on people who were in the final stages of AIDS was called the Lazarus effect. It was called the Lazarus effect. People took these drugs and literally got up off of their deathbeds and went on to live for, for many decades uh, in relative health. Um, uh, HIV became a chronic manageable condition if you could get on these medicines. But that's not the end of the story. Okay, so this chart, um, you can, so this is showing you uh, deaths, deaths uh, by age group worldwide um, from AIDS, but what I'm really interested in is just the, the, the number of deaths per year, which you can see. So, ARV antiretrovirals came out in 1986, and look at that death rate. It just kept going up until it made that, that horrible bulge. Um, that's a really tragic story. Uh, why did it take so long for things to turn around, but also why did things turn around the, the way that they did in 2004? The reason is there was an, a massive international effort to get ARVs to people who needed them, and that effort was led by the United States and by the president at the time, who was a Republican, as, you, as many of you remember, George W. Bush. Um, a massive international network was built, international organizations, um, public institutions like the University of Washington, private donors, and the, the US federal government, two big important programs. So the, the WHO's global funds, uh, which Kofi Annan uh, helped to found and really spearheaded, and then George W. Bush's program, PEPFAR, um, this is a picture of him announcing it in his 2003 State of the Union speech. Um, PEPFAR alone allocated tens of billions of dollars to fight AIDS in countries outside of the United States, so to make those drugs available to people who could not afford them. Um, it is the largest amount of money ever spent by one country to fight one virus beyond that country's borders. So this was a remarkable, um, moment of international leadership and a humanitarianism that was led by the United States, and it was in the service of a global vision. It was, it was, it was, in this, it, it was to help people outside of our borders, uh, um, under the assumption that that was a good thing for everybody. The situation turned around. The global death rate from AIDS fell by about 50% as a result of these international initiatives. So what I want to say is it takes global coordination to deal with a pandemic. A pandemic is a global problem. We need the UN. We need global institutions. We need leadership with a vision that's not just about the United States. Um, we don't, isolationism and like blaming other countries is, is really the opposite of what it would be awesome if, if um, uh, you know, leaders were focusing on and, and different leaders have of course had different responses. Um, we're dealing with a virus that is a lot more contagious than HIV, so it makes even more sense to approach this as a global problem. I don't think that we can shut our borders, and I, I don't think that we're going to be able to reverse the global nature of, of the economy that we're in. Um, and, and, and because of that, global public health is a, is a domestic problem for the United States as well. Okay, so the other like, hopeful thing I want to say um, is to remind you of all the activism that happens as a result of the AIDS, of the AIDS crisis. So these activists, people like ACT UP, which was a group founded in the United States that had, that, that had chapters all over the world in its heyday, they reminded us all that disease is political. Disease, illness is not something that happens to you apart from what your elected officials are up to. Rather, your elected officials have a responsibility to protect you. 
we need a coordinated response on the part of, of city, state, and federal officials. This is an everybody problem, just like AIDS was an everybody disease. AIDS activists were really good at making this point. Um, so this, this is a slide of the ashes action, which was something that ACT UP did in 1992. Activists, uh, um, and ordinary people who got in touch with ACT UP who were grieving, like literally brought the ashes of their loved ones who had died of AIDS and threw them over the White House, the fence of the White House onto the White House lawn um, to demand a better federal response to AIDS. Um, here's another example. This is the AIDS Memorial quilt, which many, many people have seen, probably a lot of you have seen. Uh, here it is on the National Mall. So making grief political, saying the names of the people who have died, um, um, making sure that each one is remembered as an individual and demanding that, that elected officials do better, put more money into funding, put more money into health systems. That, uh, it took too long, but that really changed the way that the history of the HIV pandemic um, unfolded. It really did, it had an enormous impact. Um, so we've seen this with COVID already. This is a slide of, um, Nurses protesting just in April of 2020 at the White House. Um, they read the names of their colleagues who had died of COVID. They held up their pictures. They accused the president of having blood on his hands in, a, in an eerie echo of the AIDS activism of the 90s. Um, they called on the federal government to have a better response to provide more PPE for health workers to keep them safe. Um, so I think this is a really good thing to remember right now. We have a right to demand good public health. The history of AIDS also shows us that we may not get it until we do demand it and demand it loudly. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Professor Warren. Hey, everybody. It's lovely to see so many people here. And by see, I guess I mean see panels with wonderful names on them. Um, I am going to try to share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so um, as Professor Amara stated, I am a historian of colonial Latin America and I teach a course on the history of global health. Um, two things that um, uh, you can take away from that that will become evident over the course of my talk is that I'm going to sort of pull the the um, time period that we are discussing today back quite a bit to the start of the 19th century. Um, and I'm also going to focus my comments largely on the um, global south, uh, touching on a theme that came up in Professor Marhofer's uh, discussion, um, and that is the issue of inequality and access to health care. So in um, early September 1803, uh, the King of Spain, Charles IV, ordered a physician and surgeon to accompany orphan children on a journey across the Atlantic, using them as part of an unprecedented campaign to improve public health. Having learned of the smallpox vaccine's discovery in England several years earlier, um, and having acquired samples of that vaccine, the king reasoned that orphans' bodies could be used on the high seas to incubate and transport the vaccine until they arrived in Spain's colonies. Known as the Royal Philanthropic Vaccine Expedition, this group set sail from Spain in late November 1803 and reached Puerto Rico, its first stop in the Americas, in February of 1804. Now, in what ways does this centuries-old effort to vaccinate ma uh, matter to us? And how might we link it to the longer history of global health and our current crisis? Um, I want to suggest that it is important for two reasons. First, it constituted the, the earliest government-led attempt to carry out an overseas health intervention that was global in scope. Participants in the expedition introduced the smallpox vaccine not only to the Canary Islands and many of Spain's colonies in the Americas, but also to the Philippines and Macau before returning uh, to uh, Spain itself. It was, in this sense, the world's first global health expedition. Second, the expedition constituted the first case in which a specific medical in, uh, innovation would be disseminated on its own to prevent disease pandemics. Smallpox had ravaged populations in the Americas for centuries, as this 16th century image from Mexico shows. Vaccination raised the hope that the disease could, not, could one day be eliminated. It was thus a magic bullet of sorts. 
The attempted use of magic bullet medical innovations to eradicate disease has been a key approach within the long history of overseas health uh, interventions, the efforts that eventually gave rise to the modern global health movement. In the early 20th century, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, sought unsuccessfully to eradicate hookworm in Latin America through the use of the drug thymol. It later attempted to eradicate yellow fever with vaccines and insecticides. World War II raised the possibility that DDT could be used to eradicate malaria, leading to Cold War campaigns in the 1950s and 1960s. And of course, vaccination eventually led to the full eradication of smallpox by 1980. Focusing on magic bullet medical innova uh, innovations is in many respects admirable. It has come, however, at a cost. As an approach, it is sat in competition with methods of improving health worldwide that emphasize developing health systems infrastructure and addressing inequality more broadly. Indeed, despite previous opposition from the United States, in 1978, delegates at the Alma Ata Conference on Primary Health Care declared health broadly defined um, as it to be a universal human right, and they committed governments to expanding health infrastructure and access to primary health care. Debt crises and neoliberal structural adjustment measures imposed on the Global South, however, thwarted such lofty goals beginning in the 1980s. In many countries, governments repeatedly slashed public health budgets uh, to service their debt obligations. Meanwhile, for much of this period, global health organizations focused on high impact selective medical innovations that could be delivered and implemented without fully developed healthcare systems in place. As COVID-19 spreads in the global south today, we witness the consequences of prioritizing magic bullet medical innovations while failing to invest adequately in health infrastructure and access. Ultimately, both are important. Take, for example, the case of Lima, Peru, a city of stark contrasts where I carry out much of my research. Despite adopting some of the strictest lockdown measures in Latin America in the last few months, Peru has suffered from some of the region's uh, highest per capita COVID-19 infection and mortality rates. Moreover, in the absence of a magic bullet vaccine or treatment, COVID-19 appears to be reshaping Peruvian society. A century after the Royal Philanthropic Vaccine Expedition's uh, 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 surgeons arrived in Peru, Lima's population began to grow immensely, soaring from 223,000 people in 1900 to 10 million people today. This increase occurred as provincial migrants uh, flocked to the capital in search of a better way of life. Yet, facing a dire shortage of job opportunities today, along with the inadequacy of Peru's heroic but chronically underfunded health system in a pandemic, migrant families are now abandoning densely populated Lima by the tens of thousands, in some cases returning to their villages on foot. Carrying their children and only a few belongings, they pose the risk of spreading COVID-19 throughout Peru. And indeed, this has now occurred in Northern Peru um, and among indigenous communities in the Amazon. The ongoing struggles with COVID-19 in the absence of adequate health infrastructure, however, also reveal the courage and resilience of Peru's people. Facing the arrival of a pandemic, Rural communities um, have taken control of their own public health measures. For example, in the village of Chacoya, featured in this slide, residents posted their own roadside health warnings, ordering relatives returning to Lima to self-isolate as an act of solidarity. In San Luis, on the other hand, villagers built traditional straw and mud huts, uh, centuries old forms of construction, to house returning migrants during self-isolation. In this sense, while the current COVID-19 pandemic reveals the perils of inequality, underfunded health systems, and over-reliance on magic bullet medical interventions like vaccines, it also sheds light on the tenacity of everyday people during times of crisis. 
Um, and with that, I would like to introduce the chair of the department, Professor Glennis Young. Thank you very much, Adam, for that fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, I too am going to make uh, the pr transition to sharing my screen. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of our uh, guests for being with us uh, today. So I'd like now to shift our perspective to Europe. What does Europe have to teach us about successful response to COVID-19? Because Europe has so many countries and because their success has been so varied, the continent is a laboratory for entangling what matters and what doesn't. The virus originated in China, not in a lab, but from animal to human transmission. But Europe has been one of its epicenters. European countries such as Italy, Spain, and the United Kingdom have had staggering losses. In Russia, the official count of 3,888 3, cases, uh, 388000 cases, excuse me, and 4,374 deaths is certainly too low. Local officials have every incentive to underreport both and Putin's approval rating has been declining. But although Russia is the main focus of my research, I wanna to focus today on a different issue, country, Germany. One European country has emerged as a European success story and that's Germany. Why has Germany, a large country with 16 federal states and an aging population, been so effective, comparatively speaking, in reducing transmission and death? Why has the number of severe cases and deaths been lower, comparatively speaking, in Germany than in many other countries? Whoops, I realize I haven't. So here we are with Europe, and here we are now going forward to the star, in some ways, of this German show. With good reason, much credit has gone to Angela Merkel, the chancellor. Merkel's professional background makes her ideally suited to be the consummate crisis manager during COVID-19. She has a PhD in quantum chemistry and until 1989, she was a research scientist in East Germany. She's provided understanding of the pandemic scientific dimensions and ab an ability to communicate scientific ideas. Merkel is one of a number of female leaders, especially in Europe, but also in New Zealand and Taiwan, who have been praised for their leadership in response to COVID-19. Like Merkel, these leaders have demonstrated honesty and transparency, decisiveness and empathy. The numbers of cases and deaths in these countries has been comparatively low. There's no doubt that these leadership qualities are important. But there's more to Germany's, or for that matter, Denmark's or Iceland's success than leadership skill alone. In explaining Germany's success, many analysts have moved beyond Merkel and even the excellent medical care that Germany has provided COVID victims. Germany, it turns out, has much to teach us about the importance of political factors ineffective COVID-19 response. So what are those factors? One is the importance of Germans' trust in political institutions and Germany's commitment to building political trust. As Jens Spahn, Germany's federal minister of health puts it, it is critical that governments inform the public not just about what they know, but also about what they do not know that is the only way to build the trust needed to fight a lethal virus in a democratic society, he continues. And he reminds us, in a democratic society, transparency and accurate information is far more effective than coercion. He adds that Germany has slowed the virus's spread because, as he puts it, the vast majority of citizens want to cooperate out of a sense of responsibility for themselves and others. And he realizes that Germany cannot rest on its laurels. He has written, for example, 
To maintain this success, the government must complement timely information about the virus with open public debate and a roadmap for recovery. Another factor is the importance of decisive created at creative and coordinated local response. Here the major example is the district of Heinsberg in the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia. You can see the location of North Rhine-Westphalia uh, in red on the map of Germany on the left. In the first week of March, it was the German epicenter of the crisis with only 2,055, 200,055, uh, 2, 2, 2, for some reason numbers aren't good for me today, it had a third of the cases. But the number of cases has decreased steadily from the end of March. So why is that? The administration of the district acted quickly when the first case appeared on February 25th. On February 26th, the district administrator addressed residents in a video message, promising to keep residents informed. And he followed through on that. The mayors of all the district towns developed a common and cooperative response. Those mayors invented a structure in which they acted as a liaison between the crisis management teams in towns and the crisis management team on the level of the district. So, in conclusion, what can we learn from Europe and Germany in particular about effective COVID-19 response? It's a lesson about politics, but a bipartisan one. If we want to fight COVID-19, other pandemics, and other catastrophes, we need to elect leaders who take crises seriously, as Merkel has done, communicate effectively, and demonstrate compassion. We need to rebuild trust in political institutions. And on the local level, we need decisive, creative, and transparent leadership. It's going to be a long haul, but the need is urgent and clear. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to Professor Margaret O'Mara, our host. Glennis, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for these presentations. This sort of roundtable was exactly why we, these, this, this, this information was exactly why uh, we thought it was so important to come here today and to, to look specifically about what we can learn from the past and also comparatively across, um, across the, the globe. And there have been some, and a lot of the themes that our speakers touched upon really were echoed by um, the questions that many of you submitted in advance. Um, these, the, the through line of inequality, um, where some, where the inequalities already present in American society and in global society have become ever more apparent in the COVID response, the importance of institutions, both at the national level and the local level, as well as the global and supranational level. Um, and questions about where's our magic bullet? When will the lockdown end? When will the next phase begin? How can we, what, how will we know? How will we learn? I want to, um, but and a few people asked about a pandemic that we didn't talk about yet, but is one where, again, there is a history behind the headlines, which is that of the 1918 influenza pandemic. Um, and so I was wondering if I could um, invite my, my colleagues to sort of think and comment about, you know, where, where we think there are some lessons there, and particularly, um, Professor Gregory, if I may, um, as I know that in addition to um, your other other work on the Great Depression, you also have um, uh, written and sp uh, done a lot of work on 1919, um, a, 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 the year after. Um, and so what are your thoughts on both the economic reverberations of that pandemic, as well as the political reverberations? Because that certainly was one, um, that's certainly another issue on the mind of many of our many in our audience. Well, my first thought is we all need to come back next week when Professor Nancy Bristow is going to be speaking in another one of these forums exactly precisely about the 1918 pandemic. She's the author of The American Pandemic, the book on that subject. So everything I would be saying, I get more or less from her. 
Um, I, I think um, the uh, context of World War I was so decisive in the response to that pandemic, both it just crowded out the information and crowded out the worry uh, about the spread of that disease. So when you read the newspaper coverage from late 1918 in Seattle and elsewhere, um, and there's some students of mine who are actually here and have just recently written papers about this, one of the things they found is there just simply was a lot less newspaper attention to this. And everything seemed a little more matter of fact than we would imagine it should be nowadays. Um, and that I think had a lot, it had something to do with the state of journalism, the state of medicine, but also just the fact that that war was absorbing so much of the economic energy, political energy, mental energy of, of publics here and around the world. So the war mattered. Yeah, I, I was remarking to a to a friend the other day that it's interesting how little we historians talk about the influenza pandemic or teach about it. Um, and it, it, even though we talk a lot about the other things that were going on, um, and that is not to say it's been ignored. I, again, I, this is a perfect segue for the plug for Nancy. We're so delighted to have Professor Bristow. Um, come and speak about this. There have been historians who have, have researched this in detail, but it's very interesting that this was, um, this incident of mass death, that uh, this great tragedy that has been kind of, in a way, overshadowed by other other things. And, and perhaps the, the evidence, it, it shows that at the time it was um, perhaps not, not front and center as, as this pandemic is right now. Um, uh, there's a follow-up that just came in from one of our, um, just in the chat now, um, asking about uh, uh, what, this is going back to your, your talk, Jim, um, what do you think about bringing back the CCC, which is something that, that has been floated? Um, as a as a res potential response and and other kind of depression era things that um, that weren't implemented in the wake of the Great Recession and and why why that might be possible or or more difficult now. Well, I think it's a great idea and it should have been done in two thousand nine as well with so many young people, you know, unemployed and so much that could be done meaningfully in the natural environment um, and elsewhere. So it's a great idea, but it, it requires the political will and ability. It would require, you know, Congress to, imp to come up with money and that didn't happen in 2009, 2010, maybe, hopefully it'll happen this time. Mm. Um let me also, uh, before we leave the, the go, leave the topic of, of 1918 and the and the influenza. Um, let me invite other other panelists. Um, Lori, do you have thoughts on sort of comment on 1918, 1919? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Margaret. So I just wanted to say about the 19, 19, 19, uh, 1918, 1919 flu that it's really an example of people not. Um, approaching an infectious illness as something that has much to do with their government at all. Um, even though when historians look back, it's, it, there, there were dramatic differences in how different uh, states, but also even cities reacted to the flu that, that either saved lives or resulted in big losses of life. So it, it absolutely was a, a political problem in the same way that AIDS was a political, political problem. But, um, I think a lot of people experienced it as something that happened individually in their families. That was a horrible tragedy. And th this, you know, and it, 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 it was forgotten until, I mean, it's incredible, you know, how, how little we talked about the flu pandemic until recently. Um, and this really makes me think that we need some kind of a, we need, we need these global pandemic preparedness programs, that this is something that happens. It's happened all through human history, and it's going to keep happening. And and we need we need coordinated responses. Um, and there there are people who work on that. But I, I I hope that one thing that comes out of this pandemic is that we start to approach pandemics as something that that are a normal part of living on this planet, and that we have more of a plan. That's a really that's a good segue into a question that is that is coming up in the chat function, and also touches on something that a lot of 
people have been asking, uh, asked in advance, which is this question of what's the, what are gonna be the political consequences of this, um, uh, both, both in the United States and globally? Um, what can we learn about this connection between pandemics and a changed politics? And also I think another set of questions that came in in advance were about how, how do our current politics in the United States become somewhat confounding. I think, Lennis, this touches on a number of the things and sort of the comparisons that you alluded to in your in your talk. But let me let me open this up for for all of my colleagues to respond to this political what's what what does this mean for for politics? Sure. Well thank you, Margaret. I'll just get the ball rolling and then others can jump in. Um, I would say that the political consequences of the COVID-19 crisis um, look to be so multifaceted and varied around the world and also so, uh, you know, mutually influ influ influencing in very, very unpredictable ways. So, you know, we have everything from the case of Germany where um, Merkel's approval rating has gone up um, because of how effectively not just she, but, but uh, the German government all the way from the federal to local level has handled the crisis uh, to uh, Putin's Russia, where Putin's approval level has gone down. It's now, according to the latest poll, 59%, which sounds high, but comparatively speaking, it's actually not very high. Um, in 2014, it was 80%, and there's uh, been tremendous discontent in Russia about uh, increasing poverty as a result of the virus, increasing poverty in general because of the economic effects, the declining price of oil and so forth, and the failure of the Russian government to pay the uh, medical workers the supplement that it promised. Um, we have the case of Hungary in which the leader, Viktor Orban, um, uh, staged something of a coup um, a couple of, in April in terms of suspending elections and essentially making himself a dictator and eliminating freedom of the press. And we have the United States where we have uh, and our moderator and our other and Professor Gregory can also speak to this where we have an election coming up um, and we've just had tragic uh, racially motivated violence and it remains to be seen how things will work themselves out. It also looks like Xi Jinping in China is strengthening his hold on power and using the situation of the coronavirus um, crisis to actually um, uh, accentuate um, China's hold over Hong Kong. So there's no, what, what, what is clear is that the political shockwaves from this will be immense but exactly what they will be and how they will interact with each other globally, that, that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. But maybe some of my other, maybe some of my colleagues can, can speak to that, this, mm -hmm. this issue further. Yeah, I can jump in briefly and, and just say that I think, you know, there's, there's a phrase in many Latin American countries that when the, the United States sneezes, uh, Latin America gets pneumonia, the, the economic repercussions of what is uh, taking place right now are going to be far more dramatic in a lot of Latin American countries than they uh, will be in the United States. And that's not to diminish the, the gravity of what's happening here, but just to say that if you look at a country like Peru, right, um, Peru's economy, two of the leading uh, segments of Peru's economy are mining and tourism. Right now, the border, tourists can't travel to Peru. Uh, mining is a very dangerous activity in a, a, in a pandemic where social distancing is required. So the, you know, Peru is lucky to have been uh, relatively in a better economic situation at the start of this pandemic than it had been in a long time. Um, but it was also in a period of, of what we could call sort of ongoing political crisis and instability in which corruption scandals have led to the arrest and, and, and imprisoning of, of many political figures, including many former presidents. Um, and the current president who's in office um, was the, the vice president called in to replace the, the then president who was arrested and removed from power. Um, so the, this is a, um, 
this is a situation in Latin America where the the it's hard to know where the economic uh, what the effects of of the the economic downturn uh, will be, but it's a it's happening in a time that was already politically turbulent, and one needn't just look to Brazil and Bolsonaro and the move to the right in Brazil, and the kind of um, terrible and, and racist ways in which Bolsonaro is framing the Brazilian government's response and neglect of the pandemic to, to see that there's going to be shockwaves for, for quite a while across the region. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, this this kind of a question that came in in advance um, from a participant, I think is, is an interesting one. Um, how might changes in the world since notable pandemics of the past make recovery harder or easier? And one of the things that is raised by your comment, Adam, as well as the comments of others, is the interconnectedness of our globe of our economic system, our global economic system. Globalization has always been with us, but it has a certain character now. What, how would, what panelists, what would your response be to that? What about makes, what, what has happened since last pandemic, the you know, past pandemics that makes recovery easier or harder? Well, one thing that um, is, a, is a positive is that as a result of um, research on HIV, uh, the science of viruses is better. Um, and we have uh, global health infrastructure, a lot of it, like based at UW and in Seattle um, that did not exist before uh, the 2000s. So, so those are two really positive notes uh, on that one. Yeah, I, I would just add that, um, you know, I think we've seen an absolutely historic collaboration by medical experts, epidemiologists, doctors, you know, and some of the drug companies just jumping on this and it's crossed borders. It's sort of, uh, you know, gone beyond what the WHO can do. And, but at the same time, you see the current US administration interrupting things, defunding WHO, trying to grab control over some of these technologies in a way that is really, really potentially very, very dangerous for everyone. So I think you've got two different currents running here and hopefully the more generous collaborative one will, will win out. It would help to have a different, different administration in the United States. I would, I would just add to that, I think that's a great point, but if you think pe people probably mem remember the controversy about identifying the virus that caused AIDS and naming it, and there was a competition between French and American labs. Um, the, the situation around SARS-CoV-2 has been much more collaborative, completely different. People are open source sharing their research um, and the, the virus was sequenced very quickly and all of that has been really positive. So there's been a, a change towards in favor of collaboration um, in the scientific community since, since the 80s. And I might add that, you know, what's interesting, because I study, among other things, I study the tech industry, which is intensely globalized and has a global supply chain and, you know, all the, the Apple devices we use or the Android devices are, you know, made in China. I mean, there's, a, there's this interconnection that in a way works against nationalist solutions that, that even if there are national leaders that really would, you know, think about, you know, repatriating jobs, you know, keeping, keeping solutions kind of within national borders, limiting immigration. There is this broader, the, the globalization is so baked into the business model that, that it makes it really in a way may, you know, it, it forces global reckoning and where, you know, it's clear, clearly that the efforts to say, you know, and um, the, the ban on flights from China, for example, was actually not that, was not effective because it is <laughs> SeaTac Airport. You know, people continue to Americans and 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 people continue to come in from China. So there was this. You know, the reality is, and we see this very vividly in a place like Seattle, which is so globally connected. Um, and it's one reason we were the hot, an early hotspot. And it's also another reason that we've we've kind of come where the the how we've come so thus far. I would argue. Um, so. 
I think this is a, I, I have a, um, a question came in and uh, for Glenis in particular, um, which I think is interesting when we think about kind of the different country responses. So you presented, um, Professor Young presented the case of Germany, um, but Europe has a, a different case, a different approach in the case of the country of Sweden. So what would your response, and let me, let me properly um, phrase the, you know, Sweden has, is, has come to be regarded as a failure. It's 430 deaths per million is four times what occurred in Germany. I wonder if you comment on why some of the factors you convincingly identify in the German case do not seem to be having the same positive effect in Sweden. Right. Well, you know, I, I need to preface this remarks by saying that I'm not an expert on the history of Sweden or on Swedish politics. Uh, and I might need to rely on the expertise of some of my colleagues uh, on, the Swedish, on the Swedish case. But it's my understanding that, well, for one thing, Sweden is not noted for, as far as I know, for having um, effective, uh, as effective central leadership as the other countries. It didn't go into lockdown to the extent that other countries did. Um, you know, it is a Scandinavian country, and so it's kind of tempting to think that all Scandinavian countries behave uh, the same, but there are actually very different histories there and very different political cultures. I would say that this is a factor I thought about um, em emphasizing um, is, you know, the different political cultures that exist in nations and different attitudes towards political institutions and so forth. Um, so that's pretty much what I would have to say about, you know, about the Swedish case. Um, just very different choices that were made, it seems to me, um, and again, perhaps some others can fill in the detail about, you know, the central issues that we've seen in this pandemic. Um, to what extent are, are politicians, leaders at all levels going to communicate quickly, openly, honestly, and follow through on their promises? To what extent are they able to, um, these would be the, 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 the uh, factors that I would look at in Sweden. To what extent was there adequate cooperation on the local level on the, on, in the way that there was in Germany? Uh, to what extent uh, were, were the uh, recommendations that were given by uh, doctors and by political figures actually followed by, by Swedish citizens, uh, and to what extent was, has technology been used? That's another major factor in our possible recovery, the, the, the possibilities that technology opens for contact tracing. So that's what I would have to say, but again, I defer to others who know more about the Swedish model than I do. I, I would just add, if I could, thanks Professor Young, that this brings up a theme that I've seen in some of the media coverage recently about whether authoritarian societies or democratic societies are better at responding to pandemics. And some people, there, there was a really influential op-ed early on in the New York Times about how we need authoritarian measures. Um, and I've seen you know, stuff about how, well, China's, China's done much better than the United States, but China's an authoritarian country and we're a democratic one. And I think that what the, the, if you think about the variety of different nations in Europe, Putin's Russia, Sweden, I mean, the, the, hard, the horrible things that the Italians have had to deal with, um, another democratic country versus the UK. Um, it's not the case that authoritarian regimes are necessarily always better at dealing with pandemics. It just isn't. Uh, there, there, are a, there are a set of things that some countries did that are effective. And I think Germany is a really good example of that. Uh, and Germany is a very democratic country. It's possible to do that in a democracy. Um, I mean, th this has really been quite an eye-opening experience living in Seattle that, uh, as you all know, democratic countries have really strong executive power in public health crises to do things like tell us to stay in our houses, um, to shut all restaurants except for takeout. You know, these are, uh, and um, there have been scattered protests, but by and large, in democratic countries, that, that's possible. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I would just like to... Uh, follow up on that. Thank you, Professor Marho, for um, in terms of il using the Russian case to illustrate that the point that authoritarian political um, regimes are not necessarily um, more effective in combating pandemics. Russia, 
the, you know, as I mentioned, the Russian uh, statistics are certainly, official statistics are certainly vastly underreported in terms of cases, seriousness of cases and deaths, because there's so much of an incentive on the part of health officials, on the part of, you know, regional officials to underreport the, the uh, numbers in all of those categories. And those kinds of disincentives to underreport cases, whether it's of a famine uh, or a pandemic or some other major catastrophic event, um, that unfortunately exists in uh, authoritarian regimes. And that because in many authoritarian regimes, uh, whether it's now in Russia or China, um, it's often local officials, whether political officials or health officials, who are very vulnerable to being scapegoated so as to protect uh, the, the face of the authoritarian leadership itself. Uh, those kinds of disincentives are structural ones that uh, tragically for the, the, the citizens of those countries uh, are structural impediments to successfully fighting pandemics, fighting famine, um, dealing with public health emergencies and um, providing public goods of all, of all sorts. So I think it's very important to, you know, push back very strongly against that, that claim. I would just add to this discussion that in terms of sort of authoritarian measures, I mean, what often comes to people's minds is sort of the, the, the heavy policing of society and the imposition of quite strict controls on the movement of people. And certainly in the case of Peru, much of that has happened, even though Peru is a democracy, right? Um, but there, the, the lockdown that took place was one uh, similar to some in, in European countries where people could only go out to go to acquire food or go to a doctor's appointment. There were very, very strict measures and the police pulled people over or detained people who were in the street um, uh, for without those, those justifications. Um, but what some of the research coming out of Peru is that the, the central problems about with regard to transmission in a city like Lima come down to things like where do they actually get food, right? So the, the one of the main sources, uh, sites of transmission in, um, in a country like Peru are things like public markets where despite whatever measures might be put in place to try and enforce social distancing, the market is enclosed, it's crowded, there's people, there's bustling back and forth. And ultimately the, the state doesn't have the resources to, to regulate movement within there. And, and this leads to the, the um, increased airborne transmission especially among uh, populations that can afford to buy food in a public market, but not in a, in a supermarket, right? So it, it, it brings on uh, about further class dimensions. If I could just give one personal anecdote about the experience of being in a, in a global pandemic and being in a, an authoritarian um, uh, country. Um, in 1986 to 7 to 88, I was in the Soviet Union um, doing research on my dissertation. And the official law was that all, anyone, any foreigner who was going to be in the country uh, longer than 90 days had to have an AIDS test. So, you know, to make uh, a long story short, I really never had completely an AIDS test uh, in the Soviet Union. I showed up. Um, it didn't work out because the syringe um, that I brought, you know, uh, didn't work and that was that. Um, so I wasn't kicked out of the country. So, you know, there, there, one has to push back also against the assumption that even that authoritarian um, regimes can actually impose control and, and to have their laws be implemented. It's not, you know, the laws on the books and not the enforcement of laws in practice are really two different things. That's a that's a great point. Uh, there's, there's only governments, so much governments can do. And then, and then I think another thing that um, I raised, and particularly uh, uh, Professor Warren, thinking about your slide of the, the villagers erecting their own sign, um, uh, asking for quarantine, you know, requiring quarantine. Um, and it echoes a question um, that came across before this session, asking about how mutual aid, which is something that has mutual aid groups that have sprung up in this um, 
pandemic, how that has been important in past global events. And I think more broadly, where do we see incidents of individuals where, where people, where, you know, where history is made from the bottom up during these crises and what, what lessons can we take from that? Well, let me say a little bit about the Great Depression, which um, fostered or was created an environment where many, many people worked at very local levels to try to solve issues of hunger and, and in a climate of joblessness uh, in Seattle and in most cities, social movements of the unemployed came together and some of them focused on what they called self-help. So in, in Seattle in 1931, a group called the Unemployed Citizens League began in West Seattle, a little group of guys, they were all guys, got together in a neighborhood and said, let's, let's create a, um, a sharing club, a self-help club. And they worked out arrangements with local farmers to pick crops and they traded services all on the basis of barter. And then they convinced other people around the city, this is a great idea. And within a year, there were 10,000 to 20,000 members to this organization. And they were running commissaries and uh, and they uh, lobbied the city government and state government, uh, more or less demanded that relief services be run through this self-help uh, cooperative group. It was really quite an amazing example of exactly what you're talking about, kind of a democracy from the ground up, growing out of a sense of urgency and growing out of a sense that the institutions that should be providing help weren't capable of doing so. So uh, if there's uh, an, something to hope for here, it would be that we'd see that kind of spirit, that kind of social movement of um, people uh, building solutions on their own. I think in, in the, certainly in the case of Peru, you're, uh, Professor Murray, you're absolutely right about the, the sign and the, the, the traditional uh, huts being built. These are, are reflections of uh, community traditions of self-governance in parts of the country where the presence of the state um, has, has often, if not mostly, been weak, right? Where the state is present uh, uh, at times as a um, in terms of its military presence and the, the threat of violence um, during conflict, but where the actual services of the state historically have never um, consistently been present. And so communities like the, like um, San Luis, where the, 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 the kind of mud and, and uh, uh, straw huts are being built, uh, have their own traditions of self-governance, uh, which include ideas of mutual aid as well as um, as, uh, as mutual uh, sort of, uh, self-regulation and discipline, right? So a slide I did not put up would also be the uh, images of, of community members essentially um, uh, confronting uh, members of their villages who, who defy uh, quarantine restrictions or social distancing restrictions. And there is a kind of a public format of addressing those um, those aberrations, right? So these are communities that, that draw on a much longer tradition of, of, of in a sense, of self-governance in the absence of a, of a consistently present state. Can I ask uh, a, a question of our moderator? So yeah. I'm sure everybody understands that Professor Omara is one of the world's leading experts, not only on history of technology, but elections and politics and presidential elections in particular. <laughs> so you've been asking us questions. Um, <laughs> without getting into the forecast uh, game, would you talk a little bit or what, what are your thoughts about sort of the political effects of this double crisis, mm -hmm. the pandemic followed by the depression that we're probably yeah. uh, in? How does that, how do you think that works out? Uh, I think the politi political effects in the U.S. case, if we look at U.S. history, uh, are, are immense, um, potentially immense. Um, first of all, the economy, as uh, Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign famously said, the, it's the economy, stupid. Um, the economy in modern elections has often been the thing on which a president is reelected. 
And so when the economy isn't doing very well, whether you're Jimmy Carter in 1980 or you're George H.W. Bush in 1992, um, it becomes a much harder sell. Um, or notably, uh, Herbert Hoover in 1932. And I think the Hoover-Roosevelt uh, contest in 1932 is very instructive too, um, because you also had two kind of very different ideas about what the government should do and how it should do it. Um, and that the, the Hoover had, uh, you know, a, in a way had, had some things in common with the current president and being really reluctant to, you know, wanting to let the market kind of heal itself and that they saw the government's role as encouraging, um, not, you know, not mandating the private sector do things to to right the economy. Obviously, the Great Depression, there was not also a pandemic. It's, you know, we can't kind of, it's not a total apples to apples. But it what, what crises do is they create room for um, a new political possibility to gain hold. And the ideas that Franklin Roosevelt implemented in the New Deal were um, ideas that progressive reformers had been kicking around for decades, trying to get, you know, had been working on at the state and local level, um, but really hadn't, uh, some of them were out of the realm of political possibility. And great crises, whether they be public health crises, um, the, again, the pandemic of 1918 kind of precipitates a new focus on public health and public health infrastructure in the United States. So things, you know, crisis makes things possible. Um, it is an accelerant and it is very it, it you know the, the the president trump is rightly worried about the economy and was rightly pointing to the economy a few months ago as a great triumph and a reason to, for him to be reelected and what we see for both democrats and republicans in historically it has it is a real challenge if you can't point to a strong economy and convince americans that they're better off now than they were 4 years ago that sounds hopeful <laughs> so, well, Jim, you, in, in asking me a question, you, um, you let you kind of inadvertently gave me the last word because now we've hit 5, 15 PM and I, that is time for us to let our, um, our forum come to an end, but I do not want to end before I thank all of you, all of our speakers. Um, let me also give my great thanks to my colleague, Kristen Roberts of the history department, who um, has been behind the scenes making all of this run beautifully. And to all of you who tuned in on this Friday afternoon, all of our history students, all of your families, our, our larger history community, thank you so much for being part of our community. We, you are, you, you are part of the history department and we are, even though we are not physically proximate, we are so glad that we can connect with you in this way. So thank you all very much. Have a wonderful weekend and a success.